Okay, good place to start is always with a definition. And there are many, obviously, of stigma, but one that I, I like to use is uh, up here for you, a social cultural process by which members of marginalized groups are labeled by others as abnormal, shameful, or otherwise undesirable. So a couple of key things here, marginalized groups, and that would include people with dementia and those who care for them, and the whole labeling process, that they're given a label uh, discredited uh, in language and behaviors towards them. Also, the National Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Plan, uh, of which I was uh, a member, views uh, stigma associated with dementia as a top priority action item. And uh, this was not in the original plan, but in the second go round uh, here published in 2017, it emerged from the people from the town halls that were held uh, nationwide as something that needed to be included in our national plan. So it's a concept that's been around for a long time, but it hasn't been really fully realized uh, with uh, dementia. And so I'm so pleased that we're finally uh, catching up with the rest of the world because there's a lot more activity and interest in um, other parts of, of the uh, world than here. Okay, just a little bit of uh, background information. Um, why dementia and stigma? Well, there's a number of reasons. For one thing, um, the manifestations of dementia are often those uh, that elicit um, stigmatizing behaviors from people. When we think about somebody with dementia, um, maybe they get lost or they use the wrong words or they're unable to identify even a common object like a chair. They may say, oh, that, oh, uh, that thing over there. Um, they may fail to recognize friends and family members or uh, do things that are socially unappealing like wiping their runny nose on their sleeve. All of these behavioral manifestations that are sometimes associated uh, with uh, dementia uh, can uh, make people cringe, not want to be around them, find them annoying, uh, label them as incompetent uh, uh, or unworthy in some way. So that's where the stigma part comes in. We really don't know a whole lot about the role of stigma in Alzheimer's disease and its impact on quality of life for both people with dementia and their caregivers. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. But by and large, what we do know is that um, uh, people with dementia uh, perceive themselves as being um, lower in their sense of self-worth and sense of state of uh, sense of self, even in the early stages of dementia. Now you, you might think, well, they're not, you know, that's not gonna affect them until they're really uh, unable to care for themselves, but that's not the case. And I'll be sharing with you later on some research uh, conducted specifically with uh, persons with dementia and their caregivers uh, who are within one year of from the time of diagnosis. And you'll see that it's, it's playing a major role even then. So, uh, People with dementia have told us that when they're interacting with others socially, that they feel disempowered and they have used descriptions of themselves and they're in quotation marks because these are verbatim from people with dementia as stupid, as worthless, oh, I'm always in the way. So you can see how they have begun to internalize the negative assessments of others in their environment and apply them to themselves, which can lead to depression and anxiety and social isolation and a host of really negative outcomes. So I just wanted to share a little bit uh, about what we do know in terms of stigma and dementia. And uh, my colleague, Martha, who is a, a physician, uh, reviewed uh, an article that looked at 51 different studies about stigma and dementia throughout the United States and Europe. And these were some of the conclusions from that article. 
stigma is very prevalent and it's actually worse um, than uh, in those who are ignorant. I guess I'm just gonna use that term because this comes up again and again. We have limited knowledge about the disease, have little contact with people with dementia. Uh, they're scared of them. They're uh, avoiding them because um, they don't know what's going on. In some cases, uh, people are confronted with, oh my God, that might happen to me. And that leads to um, their distancing and avoidance. We also know from the literature that uh, stigma tends to be more prevalent in men and in younger people. Uh, so keep that in mind when we're thinking about target groups that we might want to uh, specifically educate or bring into our support group so they can get to know people with dementia because it's that lack of content, uh, contact and limited knowledge about the disease itself that breeds these kinds of stigmatizing feelings. Certainly uh, the European literature and some on African-Americans in the United States say that racial and ethnic minorities are um, disproportionately stigmatized, but we don't have a lot of uh, good information about how this works and why it's so. Now, something that is very important, I think, to um, looking at targeting areas for education is that healthcare providers and social service providers sometimes contribute to the feeling of stigma on the part of the caregiver or the person with dementia by their behaviors, such as ignoring the person with dementia when they're explaining something about a test or that sort of thing, or saying, well, there's really nothing we can do for you. You've got dementia, it's hopeless. That sort of uh, behavior transmits that you're not worthy of my time and attention and can lead to uh, very bad self-perceptions on both the part of the caregiver and the person with dementia. And we don't have a good, enough good rigorous studies to be able to draw conclusions about, or I, if I could, I'd tell you, what should we do about this? Um, but we just don't know enough yet. However, the good, good news is that uh, people around the world are working on it. It's been recognized as a problem and we're trying to do uh, something about it. So um, what I want to talk about really um, in the central part of this presentation is um, what are the experiences of people who actually have dementia and their caregivers regarding stigma? And my colleagues uh, in Canada uh, have been working uh, for a long time in this area. They've concluded that stigma is an attribute that is deeply discrediting. It's been studied extensively in other uh, populations, most uh, prominently in the mentally ill, uh, in drug addiction, and in people with disabilities. And we're only now uh, getting around to looking at stigma uh, in dementia. We do know that it interferes with management and treatment of the illnesses um, that are associated with dementia. And, and by that, I mean, not just the dementia itself, but uh, that uh, another disease uh, such as hypertension or uh, cancer might be overlooked because the person with dementia is overlooked. And we know that stigma plays a central role in defining the experiences, unfortunately negative experiences in most cases for both people with dementia and their caregivers. And that research uh, is ongoing, but we'll look at a particular type of stigma called structural stigma that uh, has a lot of implications in terms of a failure to seek uh, early diagnosis and adequate treatment. So there's a big impact there. A little bit about the different types of uh, stigma. Uh, these are the four main types. Sometimes they go by other names, but these are the most common ones. Self-stigma, and that's where the person with uh, dementia uh, internalizes the feelings and behaviors and verbiage of other people about them in a negative way. Public, public stigma um, 
refers to day-to-day uh, -day interactions of people with dementia and how they're discriminated, discriminated against uh, by laypersons. Courtesy stigma or stigma by association. Uh, this is the one that affects caregivers the most. And um, as you can see here, it refers to the emotions and the beliefs of those in contact with the stigmatized person. So it's sort of a guilt by association. If you're providing care to a loved one or a family member, you get sucked into that whole stigmatizing orbit because of your close association with them and the negative expressions and beliefs and behaviors are directed towards you as well as the person with dementia. And finally, structural stigma that I mentioned uh, just a minute ago. That uh, leads to delayed diagnosis and treatment, uh, failure to access services even when they are available. And um, it's experienced by a lot of caregivers with negative effects on the course of uh, dementia. I wanna talk next a little bit about stigma and coping styles. Um, basically, there are two categories of coping styles, problem-focused and emotion-focused. Um, in general, problem-focused coping strategies are associated with less distress in care partners, but the literature uh, is still mixed on this. We need more research. So uh, it's important, I think, for uh, healthcare providers to uh, observe and to ask about the type of coping strategies that you as caregivers employ to deal with the many challenges associated with uh, uh, caregiving. Uh, so on this side, slide, you'll see the main types of uh, problem-focused and emotion-focused uh, coping, confrontive, uh, evasive, supportive, and self-reliant. These tend to be um, uh, less stressful for caregivers than emotion-focused coping, which is uh, focuses more on op optimistic, fatalistic, emotive, and palliative types of coping. And why is this important? Well, my Canadian colleagues have uh, done some research in this area, and they have shown uh, that different types of stigma are associated with different types of, uh, of coping styles. So caregivers who use confrontive and supportive coping styles um, are more, more likely to experience stigma by association. It's still not good, but it is better than um, uh, structural stigma, which is associated with um, more emotion-focused coping styles, such as evasive coping and emotive coping. Structural stigma, uh, let me just go back to uh, the definition for you. This is the type of stigma that's associated with delaying diagnosis and treatment, not accessing uh, needed services uh, and uh, failure to use uh, services to help decrease caregiver burden. Uh, so it's, it's not a good type of stigma, no type is, but this is particularly um, problematic for caregivers. And it's associated with certain types of coping styles. So uh, the next couple of slides are uh, verbatim quotations from uh, care partners about these kinds of stigmas. Uh, the first being structural stigma that I just talked about. So you can see here the caregiver is saying it was a slow process. I finally had to ask the doctor about it. He said we could do an assessment. And I said, I'd like to know what's going on. I think something should have been done earlier. It's been going on two to three years. Um, I would have liked a diagnosis earlier instead of letting me kind of walk in the dark. So this feeling of not really being a high priority because uh, of the dementia and uh, 
failure to act right away when we know that there are many benefits associated with early diagnosis and the establishment of effective treatments. A second uh, expression of structural stigma by a care partner, they, the doctors, uh, were cold and they did these tests. I don't think tests tell you much except maybe you've changed or you haven't changed a lot, but it doesn't solve the problem. And like the very first time I went, well, they didn't give us any supports or go to a counselor or anything. So what this is getting at is, well, they may say, well, your score on the mini mental uh, uh, status exam is 13, but that's not as helpful to many caregivers as uh, here are some community level supports. Here are some uh, resources from the Heritage Agency on Aging or from the Alzheimer's Association that you can use to help support your your um, caregiving journey. So it's telling us that this type of stigma may interfere with the communication and the provision of needed information by healthcare professionals. And the final example of a care partner who's experienced structural stigma, to me, it's a nice little social affair for a lot of people. I don't need this. I need information. And that's not what's happening. So they're, they're not feeling like they're getting the necessary data or information that they need to manage uh, their loved one with dementia. And that's what they want. They don't just need to chit chat. The next and last slide uh, illustrating uh, another type of uh, stigma frequently uh, experienced by uh, care partners is courtesy stigma or the kind of guilt by association type of stigma. And as you can see here, again, in their own words, these uh, caregivers are saying they didn't want to include her anymore. One lady phoned and said, you can't come because uh, we don't want you. Two ladies came to the house. We've been playing cards with you, but you can't play anymore. We don't think you should even stay in your own house. We're suggesting you get someone to take you and show you a nice place to live. So um, I don't know if uh, any of you have experienced these kinds of uh, stigmatizing events, but certainly um, they're very damaging and they're very hurtful and um, they don't help at all. Um, you know, uh, this is not a, what a caregiver wants to, to hear. Uh, you can't come, your social life is restricted uh, your recreational activities. We, we don't want you. You're no good is the implication. And uh, you should be in a home. Uh, second one, I've had friends for 30 years. They've turned their backs on me now. We used to go for walks and, and they would phone me and go for coffee. Now I don't hear from any of them. Those aren't true friends. True friends will stand behind you and not in front of you. That's why I'm not happy. And uh, this is a very common phenomenon. Um, and, uh, you know, when I personally experienced, my father, uh, died from uh, Lewy body dementia and I could see, uh, just the dwindling of, uh, people calling. They were uncomfortable. They didn't know what to say or do. Uh, maybe they were, uh, misinformed. They thought it was contagious or whatever, but they, very few people really stood by uh, my parents through his decade long. Uh, journey. And that was particularly hurtful to my mother as, as a caregiver. I wish we were uh, together face to face because what I would do is ask you to share some of your stories or experiences uh, illustrating these various types of stigma, but um, perhaps we can have a dialogue in another venue some other time. And the final one, I think there is people who don't ask me to go places or do things because I have a dementia. I think a lot of people don't know what dementia is and that's that public ignorance part. I think it scares them because they think of it as crazy and that really hurts. So we see uh, that ignorance is a huge problem here and that it breeds social isolation and uh, that can negatively affect both the person with dementia and their caregivers. Okay, uh, next I wanna turn to um, a study that my colleague Sandy Bergner and I uh, conducted. Uh, Sandy uh, lives in the Chicago area. And uh, I'm not gonna belabor the, 
belabor the research parts of it, except to say that we uh, had uh, samples from uh, both Chicago and uh, Iowa, and that's why you'll see that a uh, good representation of African American uh, people in terms of uh, ethnicity. Um, the average age of our sample of persons with dementia was um, uh, in the uh, late 70s, a well-educated group, uh, some college education on average. Um, and as I uh, mentioned earlier, we were striving for uh, people who had, were uh, one year uh, post-diagnosis. And we were, came pretty darn close to that. Uh, we did two different types of studies. One was uh, quantitative or where we collected like survey data, uh, questionnaires and that sort of thing. And then the thing I'm gonna be talking most about uh, today are the qualitative analysis where we did in-depth uh, interviews of a subsample of 22 uh, caregivers and people with dementia. So uh, just briefly one slide on what we found in the larger uh, quantitative study that is the one with uh, surveys and questionnaires and so forth. We um, found that uh, stigma is a very meaningful and measurable reality for people with dementia and that um, their levels of stigma as reported in an instrument called the stigma impact scale was comparable or in most cases far greater than uh, populations with other chronic and terminal illnesses, comparing them to the data on people with Parkinson's disease or cancer or stroke. Um, so nothing to take lightly. It, uh, the stigma of dementia is right up there with uh, other diseases uh, and illnesses that we encounter in later life. And no surprise here, we found that among uh, people with dementia, the more they perceive themselves to be stigmatized, uh, the lower their self-esteem became and the higher their levels of cognitive impairment. And from the caregiver data we collected, we found also that higher perceptions of stigma was associated with lower levels of recreational and social activities and more cognitive impairment in the person they were caring for. So this relates back to that whole notion of uh, courtesy or uh, stigma by association. People stop going out. Uh, they don't want to be laughed at or um, insulted. Uh, and it's just easier to stay home and stop doing things. So uh, basically the uh, qualitative interviews that I'm going to be reporting on next in part um, uh, were conducted again with this uh, uh, subset of 22 dyads, the caregiver and the person with dementia. We had 11 in-depth uh, questions and I'm not going to be going all of, over all those, but just a few to give you a flavor of uh, how the person with dementia feels after one year uh, post-diagnosis and how stigma has affected or not affected their life. And I think this is important um, information for caregivers to have so they can be aware of it and perhaps try to do something about it. So the first question, describe how you feel about uh, talking about your diagnosis with family and friends. Well, most people, a little over half, did not have a problem uh, sharing their diagnosis with family or friends. However, more than 40% had some difficulty uh, and a surprising percentage had not yet disclosed their diagnosis to family and friends, even though they were a year post-diagnosis. And some of the reasons that they mentioned I've captured here in these slides. Um, a clear cut theme that will come through is the final bullet on this page. In general, children seem to have most difficulty accepting the diagnosis. And as we work through some of these uh, responses by people with dementia, it'll be easy to see uh, how the relationship with adult children is easily the most affected 
by the dementia di diagnosis. And of course, the caregiver is caught, if, especially if it's a spouse caregiver, is often caught right in the middle of that generational um, conflict. So we ask, have you uh, disclosed your diagnosis to family and friends? 64% um, uh, of the people uh, have disclosed that. Some limited that or qualified that to only good friends, uh, or I don't talk about it unless the subject comes up. I'm most comfortable talking to somebody who has the same cognitive difficulties, kind of, you know, one of a kind. But more than a third of the people that were very close to the vets with their diagnosis. I don't tell anybody unless they ask. I like to keep it private so that people don't joke about things like <laughs> senior moments and so forth. What about your diagnosis are you most uncomfortable discussing? Uh, and here's another thing that comes through again and again. I'm most comfortable talking to the people in my church. I think this has a lot of implications for strategies that we might use um, some churches have uh, what are called parish nurses that are, that are nurses who are employed by uh, the church itself, and they do outreach into people's homes. It's a wonderful concept, and they have been uh, exceptionally beneficial to people with dementia and their caregivers. Um, the discomfort, again, uh, just a little bit uh, below half the people uh, had experienced, uh, were uncomfortable discussing their uh, diagnosis, um, uh, uh, dependency and uncertainty, and uh, the behavior of healthcare professionals were common themes that made people with dementia uncomfortable about even disclosing their diagnosis. You, you can just hear the person saying, <laughs> Hey, look at me, I'm here too. Don't talk over or around me, talk to me. Who are you most comfortable interacting with at present? Church associates again comes through, family and close, close friends. Others uh, said um, my activity groups, my volunteer groups, my neighbors, small groups is something that uh, comes through again and again. And I'm sure you as caregivers, you have long recognized that the person uh, with dementia does better in small rather than in large groups. Um, so the, these were pretty consistent uh, responses. And so these are the types of associations or groups or social uh, contacts that as caregivers, uh, you may wish to forge and create opportunities to uh, break that vicious cycle of social isolation. What changes have you made in your social networks? Um, pretty much half and half. Um, and here are some of the uh, examples of uh, changes uh, people had made. I only talk to friends on the phone now. I don't invite people over. Um, their so social life has diminished. Uh, I'm more comfortable with people with the same diagnosis, which says something for the benefit of uh, uh, support groups. Um, and uh, a, another theme that comes through again and again is social isolation and the lack of ability to uh, drive, which um, really diminishes their social networks. Restrictions in social life, a little less than a third uh, said they had no restrictions on their social life. Now this is one year post-diagnosis, remember. And again, the theme, I'm especially comfortable uh, with my church groups. A full 70% acknowledged restrictions in their social life. Uh, a lot of them around transportation issues. <laughs> my wife is dragging me around. I have to take the bus. I can't drive. Um, I have to use reminder notes. I use reminder notes, so I don't think that's a particular restriction, but this is what uh, the people with dementia told us. Do family members treat you differently? About half and half again. And the same theme that comes through, look how many times, and these are just selected uh, quotations. My children treat me like a baby. 
My children avoid contact with me. My son doesn't want to talk about my diagnosis. My children say, I can't do this, I should live alone. Um, I think these are really important uh, responses because they tell us um, people with dementia, even at one year are experiencing a loss of independence, infantilizing treatment and children. And if we target any group for edu educational programs, maybe we should be focusing on adult children, uh, educational programs about dementia for them so that they um, understand the diagnosis and understand better ways to interact and support not only the person with dementia, but whomever is caring for them at home. How is your quality of life been affected by memory loss and diagnosis? Two thirds of the respondents, again, echoed the themes of I'm more dependent, I've lost my driving privileges, I'm worried about the future, I'm exasperated and I'm fearful. And so it's good to know uh, what are these areas of concern so that we can ask about them and perhaps take measures to intervene with uh, them before they become actually absolutely more debilitating. So in summary from uh, those in-depth interviews, we um, discovered that financial concerns, at least at one year post-diagnosis were not a major concern, but there was some expressed uncertainty about the future. A social rejection, uh, moderately uh, expressed and people with dementia felt most comfortable relating to others who experienced memory loss. The notion of internalized shame uh, was quite prevalent. Uh, and this notion of being treated like a child, uh, the behavior of others, avoiding them, um, fearfulness in terms of making mistakes and social isolation, again, uh, scores in the moderate range at even uh, one year, uh, relying on others for transportation, most comfortable uh, in small groups. So uh, caregivers should be aware uh, of these are the things that people with dementia around the country have told us, uh, help them or discourage them. And that as caregivers, we can try to facilitate small group activities or church associations and so forth. So one of the things that my colleagues and I have been working on is educating healthcare professionals and um, social service providers to do a better job with uh, families with dementia. And how do we help them to deal uh, not only healthcare professionals, but the, the public to deal with stigma. So one important thing is avoiding um, stigmatizing behaviors and languages um, in our own behaviors, uh, such as saying, um, I'm having a senior moment. This is one of the reasons that came out in our uh, interviews of why people don't disclose the diagnosis or why they don't seek help early on. This whole notion of courtesy stigma or the guilt by association uh, needs to be addressed, especially with caregivers uh, who are subjected to this type of courtesy stigma. And ask about it. This is not something uh, that most caregivers will bring up on their own. And you can see on the third bullet here, many caregivers are reluctant to talk about this type of stigma because it seems like they're trying to hog the show that uh, they want to be the center of attention and not the person with dementia. So they just be quiet about it when they're being affected and their self-esteem and self-worth and levels of depression get affected by courtesy stigma. And the other thing that uh, healthcare and social service providers can do is provide families, uh, people with dementia directly and their caregivers with um, you know, facts good, solid, evidence-based information about dementia, prognosis, uh, any interventions that can be done and try to combat uh, misinformation, which is so uh, prevalent these days. So talking a little bit about effective communication. 
Uh, we do know from the small literature that's available on what interventions are effective is that if we can get people, uh, lay people, the public around people with dementia and we can educate them, providing factual information that the stigma is reduced. Um, one of the things to do is also to emphasize that it's not a one size fits all disease. There's great variability in the um, age of onset and the progression of dementia across people and across types of dementia. And the other thing is uh, many times healthcare professionals in particular will fall back on jargon and biological and neurological and genetic explanations of dementia. And uh, that is not always helpful. Um, in fact, it can make people feel more hopeless. And that's especially true, uh, what little data we have uh, for, for minorities, um, you know, focusing on, well, uh, we think that chromosome uh, 13 is uh, <clears throat> affected. <laughs> people might want to know, uh, is there a genetic or heritable uh, connection in uh, dementia, but not maybe at that chromosomal level. Uh, just understanding how it will affect them and uh, their families. Uh, what this is, is a pilot education uh, uh, program that was developed uh, for Alzheimer's Association staff. And you can see um, what was contained in this educational program. Orientation, and overview, definitions of stigma, types, much as I've tried to cover briefly today effects of stigma on individuals and families um, and some approaches, practical tips. That's what I think caregivers need the most. Advice on uh, addressing stigma and then using sample scenarios and interactive discussions to work through uh, what might be happening with um, uh, caregivers and people with dementia. And here's an example of one of those case-based scenarios. I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you because time is, growing short, but we have a scenario about Ralph uh, and how his um, social life and his uh, desire to do things that were lifelong habits and loves like card playing diminished with the onset of illness. And uh, it goes along of how his caregiver, his wife in this case, uh, Rita is distressed by these developments and wonders what she can and should do. And then, so we work with the Alzheimer's Association staff uh, interactively to say, what do you think's going on? Is this an example of stigma related to dementia? If you were talking to Ralph or Rita, what would you say or could you say? And what assistance or resources might be helpful to them? So this is how we uh, use educational programs. And I appreciate this is a very tiny slide, but what I will, um, point out to you is that uh, the responses in terms of change in behaviors of the Alzheimer's Association staff who received this educational intervention uh, were phenomenal. So um, the question at the top is likelihood that I will be better able to identify um, a stigma associated with Alzheimer's disease, 95%. Degree that training has been in impacted comfort in talking about um, stigma and dementia, 90%. Likelihood that I will change the way I interact with people with dementia, more than 95%. And likelihood that I will change the way I interact with family members of people with dementia, again, more than 95%. So the data we have suggests that these kinds of educational programs uh, can have a, a, an enormous and positive impact on uh, providers of care. Uh, so uh, the next couple of slides, and I'm, uh, I, I know I have less than five minutes, so I'll keep this uh, short. Ex uh, we examine uh, the whole notion of public uh, stigma and uh, ignorance on the part of uh, lay people. Why? Because knowing facts, having the right information about uh, dementia and caring for a person with dementia uh, leads to fewer inaccurate judgments of the person with dementia and their caregivers. 
So we wanted to look at um, how we might do that. And this, this is from my colleague, uh, uh, Shana Stites at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Here are the areas uh, that research has shown the most um, ignorance in terms of uh, the public, risk factors associated with dementia and caregiving and the disease course. So what this information suggests is that we should be aiming our public education uh, in these areas in particular, um, and then acknowledging um, some of the others that are lower, they're all lower than 100%, but what we'd strive for is that people really have a good understanding of the disease and its impact. This study concluded that caregiving knowledge, that is the understanding by the public of knowledge about caregiving leads to better support and less antipathy of the general public for caregivers and that age and gender can moderate the effects of knowledge on reactions. So older age or positive association with caregiver knowledge and support. Um, interestingly, I, I mentioned that uh, prior to intervention, um, uh, men have uh, uh, more stigmatizing uh, notions about dementia and caregivers than women. But when educated, males express even less antipathy and more positive um, expressions towards caregivers and people with dementia uh, when they have more knowledge about caregiving. So back to what we can do to help healthcare professionals and social service providers do better. Provide information uh, and support to seek timely diagnosis. This is because of structural stigma and the reluctance many times on the part of caregivers to get that diagnosis and to get the resources they need. Teaching health and coping styles. And we showed in early research how coping styles can influence um, distress on the part of the caregiver. And to ask about stigma in caregivers and persons with dementia. It's often not part of uh, the initial or ongoing assessment. And uh, as we, we said previously, caregivers are unlikely to bring it up. So we need to be proactive and say, you know, since your diagnosis, have you felt that people have treated you differently? Or can you give me an example where you felt discriminated against uh, since you've had this diagnosis of dementia? Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is um, a program put together my, by my colleague in uh, Alberta, Canada called People of Dementia. I just love this. It's uh, designed to raise public awareness and reduce stigma associated with dementia. They created a website called People of Dementia featuring human interest stories of people with dementia and their caregivers. And if you remember earlier, I said that ignorance is one of the chief drivers of stigma towards people with dementia and their caregivers. So this is what the website looks like. It has stories about people with dementia talking in their own words, family members, or those who are uh, being supportive of them. And it serves to increase awareness of dementia, advance the public's understanding of the disease. And we know that increased awareness of the stigma associated with dementia can be lessened by understanding more about the disease and the people who are affected by it. So this is uh, the type of thing that's on this website. It's Elmer happens to have uh, dementia and it has a lot of his personal expressions which really personalize and humanize the experience of uh, dementia in a way that combats stigma. And that's it for me. Let's see if we can get rid of the slideshow here. Very good. And get back to uh, Harrison, who's your next featured speaker. Thank you very much, Kitty. That was a great job. I appreciate you uh, taking the time today to spend uh, with us and, and sharing your information. That was really great. It was my uh, pleasure. Thank you. You did a great job for us. Um, Harrison is going to be our next speaker on our Did You Know segment. And uh, a little bit about Harrison. Harrison March is the Community Engagement Coordinator 
at the Heritage Area Agency on Aging. And I am going to let him share a little bit about um, Heritage and what he does there. So Harrison, it's all you. Thanks, Karen. And thanks for getting us started off here, Kitty. Um, to echo what you both said, it's fun to, to try something new here, even though we can't have our Caregiver Wellness Day in person. So I appreciate um, all the work that went into this and I'm glad that we could get this series going. Um, I am Harrison March, as Karen said. So all the information on this slide is already old news and we'll just jump right into information about Heritage. Um, what Heritage is um, technically is called an Area Agency on Aging. Um, we serve seven counties here in East Central Iowa. You can see them there on the right-hand side of the screen. And we focus on three main groups of consumers. Um, older adults, that's anyone 60 and older, an adult living with disability, and then caregivers, both for older adults and for those with a neurological disorder. Heritage supports them by um, offering services that support independent living, by allocating funding um, from the federal level, the state level, and through grant programs and donations. We allocate that all around the service area to try to address the different needs in various communities around. And then we also do some advocacy work that's uh, both locally and at the state level. And then sometimes that even extends to the national level, especially when something like the Older Americans Act comes around. That was just recently within the last uh, couple of months, I think the renewal came through for that, which we were very excited about. And that allows us to continue serving here in East Central Iowa. Area agencies on aging um, are founded under that Older Americans Act. That was passed way back in 1965. And um, Heritage itself is actually gonna turn 50 next year. So we'll have some birthday party planning to do. But we are one of six AAAs here in the state and one of 600 across the country. And through the Older Americans Act, um, it's our job to adapt to every community that we're serving, not just our own region here, but really each and every community that we cover in our seven counties. And it's the same deal for all the other agencies on aging across the state. And ultimately our goal is to support the health and independence of older adults. We wanna help them um, maintain their quality of life at a minimum and hopefully we can help them even improve it. Part of obviously supporting older adults is being able to support their caregivers. Um, that's a big part of being an independent and healthy and thriving older adult sometimes. So we wanna make sure we're covering all the bases for people. Caregiver support program then is kind of what brings me here today. Um, that's one of our core programs at Heritage and it's made up of a few different services as well as some education efforts that we do like this here today. Um, one of those services, I'll start at the top there is caregiver counseling that focuses mainly on problem solving and emotional support. Um, it kind of, you know, just when you've got issues, when you're having the, a tough day as a caregiver, um, whether you're at a, a peak or a valley, even if you're just having a great day, and you need someone to, you know, say, hey, thanks for the support or, you know, where can I turn to to help others in my community with, um, you know, the caregiving tips of the trade that I know of. Um, that's a good place to, to go. We can be available um, over the phone, our business hours or, you know, normal office hours, but we're also able to do a lot of in-person stuff. Um, COVID has restricted that to some degree, but we're happy to meet with folks in person when we're able to. Moving on to options counseling. Um, that's part of uh, one of the cool things I think that Heritage does. Um, we focus on that within the caregiver program and some of our other programs as well. Helps you make smart choices with unbiased information. Um, we're measured by how we help people and the amount of, of good that we can do to help people make smart choices and support their own goals for independent living. So when we can provide you with as much thorough, unbiased information as possible, and that helps you make really smart choices about the resources that you have available, um, not only to help you as a caregiver, but to help the person that you're caring for. Um, maybe one way to ease your burden as a caregiver is to reduce something like having to prepare meals. And so we might be able to connect you with something like a Meals on Wheels program or a, a local food distribution. Um, if COVID weren't around right now, maybe it would be a congregate dining program where people could go meet in person and socialize and have a good meal. Um, so really all about getting as much information to you as we can so that you're able to make a great choice as a caregiver and make one that's as informed as possible. The last one listed on this slide here is pretty new. Um, we picked it up last year, it's called Caregiver Case Management. And that's more of a long-term uh, program, a long-term service, I should say, for people who are gonna need support for at least three months, maybe, maybe even going further, which is totally fine. Um, we wanna make sure that 
in the case management service that we're helping you put a sustainable solution in place. So we take a look at the mental needs, emotional needs, and physical needs of the person you're caring for and try to identify what we'll call a care plan. And that will be some steps we can take, some services we can bring together from different, um, not only heritage programs, but programs and agencies around our region and in your community. And we'll get that care plan in place, help you get it moving, and then make sure that you've got the follow-up support that you need going forward. We never want to uh, you know, put this plan in place and say, all right, you know, good deal. We'll see you later. Thanks for stopping by. Um, we want to make sure that you've got that long-term support uh, so that this is something that sustains itself for a long while and helps you remain in your home, remain in your community, and maintain your independence as long as we can. I know earlier I mentioned um, education is a big part of it too. One thing that I used to hear a lot when going to resource fairs, which it feels like it's been forever since we've been able to host something like that, but we hear a lot about caregivers who uh, maybe one day that you go to sleep and it, everything's normal and the next day you wake up, suddenly you're a caregiver and you kind of are starting at square one, don't know where you're heading, don't know what resources are available. Uh, so we want to help make sure that you learn about what it's like to have that role, um, how to adapt to it, know what community resources are available. Caregiver Wellness Day obviously is a huge part of that. And there's a couple photos there from last year's event. And um, I said earlier, I wish we could do it in person because it's a lot of fun not to you know, only meet people and converse with them, but just to have a day of uh, caregivers being taken care of for once. And so I missed that event and I hope we can bring it back next year, but in place of it, I think this series is a really great way to still get a lot of information to folks. We also partner with other agencies around the um, area and there's plenty across the state even with a program called powerful tools for caregivers and that's another way to learn about the caregiving role learn how to um, take care of yourself learn tips for avoiding burnout which i know we'll hear more about in, um, in our series next month and just overall how to thrive in that new role we are able to do those classes virtually which um, is cool and I, it's a whole new undertaking because normally it's an in-person setup but if you're interested in learning more about the class or want to sign up for one, our phone number has been there at the bottom and I'll have it up here again at the end of the end of the slides here. And that's how you should connect with um, our caregiver support team and they can get you information about the upcoming series. So that's all uh, caregiver specific information. Um, one of the things I love about working at Heritage is that we do a ton of stuff, but it also means that uh, giving a presentation, sometimes it's hard to be succinct because there's so much ground to cover. So um, one way I kind of think of it is how we had bring together all these little puzzle pieces. Um, for one person, you might have a puzzle that's almost complete and you just need help with one service or one thing and you can maintain your independence or improve your independence even. Maybe it's something like uh, mowing your lawn in the summer and you need help finding a chore service that can come out and do that. Other people might be in a situation where um, they just are kind of starting out on this journey. They only have a couple of their pieces together. And so they need to pull in a lot of different parts of it. And so Heritage does have a lot of other programs and services that um, help complete that puzzle, if you will. One of them, um, I've listed a few of them here, but to start off at the top, our information referral and assistance program is sort of similar to what I mentioned earlier with caregiver options counseling, um, helping you find inf unbiased information that's really thorough and complete and helps you understand what's available in your community, how to connect with those resources. Sometimes we can make referrals if it's something like a, an attorney that specializes in elder law, we might be able to make a referral to Iowa Legal Aid who we subcontract with to make sure you're working with the best people that we have in our area and they can complete that whole follow through if it's not, a, um, not something that heritage staff do such as um, practice law. We also work, as I mentioned earlier, with adults with disability. Aging and disability resources then um, help those adults with disability find the long-term support that they need um, within their community. A big focus of not only that program, but our information referral and assistance as well is trying to make sure that we'll find these services within your own community, even if it's not right there in your city, in your town, someone who covers your region so that you can get the help you need. Um, a lot of times we'll find, especially in our rural counties, it's not right there down the street, but it's somebody who can travel from uh, Lynn County. I believe even Karen at Home and said you guys do some of that traveling a little bit outside of the Cedar Rapids area to make sure that people get the, the help that they need. And so ultimately we'll connect you with um, anybody that we can 
that's uh, available to serve you. Our elder rights team, they focus on the prevention of and raising awareness about elder abuse. I should mention, um, I always try to make sure if you or someone you know is in immediate danger, always call 911. But the elder rights team at Heritage is part of the more of the long-term recovery, helping people escape their abusive situations and creating more long-term plans for regaining their independence and making sure they have that follow-up and that support they need in the long-term. Nutrition and wellness focuses on the physical health of older adults. That program is a little different right now than it looked um, even you know four or five months ago with congregate dining um, not being the safest setting right now. So we transitioned a lot to more home delivered meals, more meal pickups, which I think um, are doing a good job addressing the gap right now, but we hope someday we can get back to congregate dining so you get more of that socialization, which is so key for older adults as well. And then wellness, we do teach evidence-based wellness classes. Right now, um, if you wanna check some Tai Chi lessons out, we've got them available on our Facebook page and on our website. Brian normally leads those classes in person, but that's just another way that we've had to adapt lately to sort of go with the flow of things and make sure that we can still get good information and good fun activities out to folks, but um, while maintaining our safety and knowing that um, it's important to have these resources available 24 seven, even when we're you know in this pandemic. So that really hits on all of our core programs there. There's even more that we do, um, but like I said earlier, there's a lot to cover and I don't want it to be too overwhelming. So if you wanna find out more information about programs, services, um, anything about Heritage really, you can head to our website there, www.heritageaaa.org. Lastly, I've just got contact information on here for our agency. Um, I, the thing I love about my job is I get to brag about all the work that my coworkers do because really they do the, the awesome people, the people helping of things and I get to talk about how cool they are. So if you do want to con or excuse me, connect with any of our services or programs, uh, call one of those numbers there on the screen. Um, we'll get back to you within a business day or two. Um, right now we're not in our office, so can't visit in person and we'll, we're checking our voicemails as regularly as we can to make sure that we're following up with people right away. And hopefully someday soon we can share updates about getting back into our office. That is a ton of information about Heritage, I know, but um, it's a, like I said earlier, it's great that we can come get here together and share all the info and get the word out about how we can support caregivers here in East Central Iowa. And I know beyond there's a lot of work, um, obviously, Kitty, you go international with some of your research, but um, even just within our network of agencies on aging here, in Iowa, um, it's a real great thing to be a part of, especially in a time like this when support is, is so key. So I appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much, Harrison. This is a, lots of information once again in a very short period of time. And, and I agree, doing the Caregiver Wellness Day when you can be in person and see people and interact with people, that is the best day ever. And I know last year we had close to 200 people uh, at the event and it was a great day. Um, having to do it differently was hard for all of us, um, but being able to offer these webinars for everybody is, is a great second way to do it. Um, so we're reaching out to people in, the, in that aspect and um, the services that we offer here in our community are still available for people. So the help is still here. It's just making sure we're getting the word out that we're, we're available to help. Um, our next seminar will be or excuse me, our next webinar will be next month, August 11th. It'll be at one o'clock again, uh, Central Time. And uh, Dr. James Coyle will be, be our guest speaker and he'll be sharing information on caregiver fatigue and self-care. Um, and I think that's so important right now because we're so inundated with taking care of our health with the COVID-19 going on and staying indoors and we're taking care of our loved ones are we still taking care of ourselves while we're taking care of our loved one and we're finding ourselves getting really down about that and getting fatigued so dr coyle will be joining us next month and he'll be our guest speaker i will be uh the did you know speaker talking about the ins and outs of in-home care and um lots of great information to share again this this uh webinar today will be recorded so you can go on to the Heritage Area Agency on Aging website. I'm going to get that right before we're done here, Harrison. We've got like five webinars to get it down. So I will have it down. 
Um, so you can go onto the website and you can rewatch uh, this whole webinar today and get more information. If you feel that this is something you um, that to share with someone that was not able to join us today, share it. This is the way to get the information out. Um, and then hopefully you'll be able to join us next month, August 11th, mark your calendars. And um, we are doing this on Facebook Live on Heritage Area Agency on Aging Facebook page. See, I'm getting better in one day. Um, and uh, we'll be able to share this news with everybody. So thank you everyone to, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Buckwalder for sharing your afternoon with us and your great information. It was great to have you on board. And uh, we look forward to, um, um, sharing the word with everybody. So I hope you all make a great day uh, with what we've been given today and the rest of the week is a great week for you as well. So thank you everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>